Hello, everyone. What's splashing? You are now tuned into Siren Sundays. This episode is proudly sponsored by Science and Perspective because we all need a little more science and a lot more perspective. And my lovely guest is the Elijah Sands, communication, Senior Communications Officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Welcome, Elijah. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to be here. You sound so far away. Oh, do I? Sorry. I, you do. I'm get closer. It's my mic. Okay, Your don't be scared. Hand. Yeah, now I'm scared. <laughs> All right, yeah, you sound a bit better now. Awesome. So it's so great to have you, my little brother <laughs> in conservation and in locks. I guess you're my big brother in locks, but yeah, I kind of surprised you know, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Nonetheless, so I really want to jump right in. Can you give us a brief intro about who you are and what you do? All right. So I get my name is Elijah Sands. Right now I'm currently the Senior Communications Officer at the Bahamas National Trust. Um, and basically what I do is I oversee the external communications efforts of the um, BNT, which is a lot just about uh, communicating, communicating conservation and raising awareness on national parks and conservation issues and how people could get involved. Awesome. So how did you get into, you know, this communicating conservation thing? Like, what was it? What was that turning point in your life where you said, aha, this is what I'm going to be doing for the next couple of years in my young life? Ooh, let me see. Uh, okay. I guess I could start a little bit from the beginning. Um, so I grew up right here in Nassau. Um, I attended Anatole Rogers High School. Um, I was always interested in biology. Um, yeah, biology, nature. I was always outside running up and down in the bush. Uh, playing with some creature or uh, i was a big fan of nat geo and discovery i never ever watched anything else other than nat geo and discovery it's the only thing i care an animal planet when i could have watched it so it was the only things i cared about spent a lot of time um just watching the shows you know being impressed by the wildlife and the things i used to see on tv um so when i went to high school about in grade 11 i think that was 2015 um the bnt had this eco camp booth display at like a fair and it's this big, nice banner, you know, a lot of cool things they're promoting. But basically, Eco Camp was this week long camp in the summer that took like kids from all around the Bahamas to Andres um, for a week just to like be in nature and camp and bird watching, swim and jump in blue holes. And that just sounds like a vacation to me. <laughs> um, at that point, I like never traveled out of the, out of that, of the island, I should say, out of Nassau. So I was wow. like, oh, maybe this could be a really cool first experience. Um, so I definitely um, signed up for the camp. Um, long story short, I was definitely chosen. Um, I was so <laughs> excited um, to go to this camp. Um, before I was accepted, a little before that, I had applied to this essay competition with Stuart's School of Dive Bahamas to win a open water scuba certification. Um, so I think you had to write an essay on what would you do to save the environment? And I was extra, I was always extra. So I wrote this super, super long essay. I didn't know they read it, but I did later learn that Haley did read it. Um, she did read it. She yeah. just talked to me about it over the weekend. <laughs> yeah, yeah so she definitely did read it. Um, and I was chosen um, to do this course and to get a free scuba diving certification. Nice. Um, the experience was, was great. It's definitely crazy. Um, you know, this is me. I always used to like fish and swim around, but I had no experience diving like that. Um, well, free diving, yeah, but no experience really scuba diving. So right. it was certainly a scary experience at some points. You know, I was small and frail and skinny. Um, <laughs> But Haley was just the best instructor ever. So I think I took a little bit longer to get my certification, but she certainly worked with me. She saw my passion. Um, she saw how interested I was. And, you know, I did my four, I did contained dives, my open water dives. My last open water dive was a um, shark dive where you go and dive around like a bunch of reef sharks. And it was like the coolest experience ever. So I think, you know, watching all the Nat Geo and stuff and just loving nature combining with that experience, I really, really just, you know, just, got so interested in the whole conservation thing. Um, I always loved the water, but I got super interested after then. Um, so I went on and got my open water dive. And then I went to Eco Camp just about a month later. And that was, to this day, still probably one of the best weeks of my life. Um, you know, I was I met so much really cool people there. A lot of my friends now, like my really close friends I met at Eco Camp, um, either they were actual students or they were like the um, which call those instructors or interns or whatever. Mm -hmm. And it was just the real, the best experience ever. And yeah, I almost wanted to cry when I came back from Eco Camp <laughs> that week. It was just so different. I was so, so changed. And the minute I came back, it's like I just wanted to stay involved with BNT. So I like hanged around the retreat for a few hours to learn how I could volunteer. 
Mm -hmm. um, I just hanged around. I got um, pretty close with the director of education, Posher, um, Sweden. And, you know, she just gave me different opportunities to volunteer and, you know, work at the trust. Um, so that summer was over, obviously, and unfortunately, I had to go back to school. But I did also stay in <laughs> Unfortunately, you finished high school. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> at that point, personally, I was not that, like, interested in, unfortunately, high school anymore. I was kind of disconnected. Um, but, you know, I went back to school. But I stayed involved with Stuart's Cove um, through Haley. She always used to... Um, but when she saw that she could put me on dives or get more certifications, she certainly made sure it happened. Um, nice. So I was able to get um, certified in line fish removal, and I became a coral, what was it, coral awareness? Reef restoration. It was like, I, I yeah. think some of the first people involved in that. Um, Check you out. Yeah, yeah. So I was, in, I was certified at, for coral restoration along with some other people. And then also dive against debris. Um, so Heidi, Heidi, Haley, sorry. My names are, I had coffee. <laughs> Um, so Haley definitely kept me involved. Um, and I also did job training at Stuart's Cove. You know, last year in high school, you got to do like a month of job yeah. training. So I did job training at Stuart's Cove as well. So eventually I graduated. Um, happiest day of my life. Um, and then I went to the BNT a few days later through a government program. Um, the government does this summer program every year for um, high school kids and kids still in college. And I came to the BNT and I was... And I was a science intern at that point. So I was an intern in the science department. Um, and to be honest, it was fun to be around, but you know, I later learned that when I came there, it was just like, okay, we got some interns, just like, put them in the bush. I remember we was like counting millipedes and stuff, um, but it was still great to be connected back to the organization. Yeah. Um, so I was a science intern for a bit. I was able to work on the conservation project. Um, nice. And that's where I found my first BNT camera. I'm at this point, I had a bunch of little point shoot cameras and GoPros. Mm -hmm. But there was this, I remember um, at that time, I think it was Anessa, she told me, you know, there's this camcorder, this brand new camcorder in this case somewhere in the office. And I went and found it. It was this camcorder in perfect condition. Um, back then, I was, you know, it was HD, it was pretty cool. Not back yeah. then, 2016. But I was like, okay, I could definitely do some things with this. And I took that camcorder and I just started to learn how to use it. Um, University of YouTube, I Googled everything. <laughs> um, I definitely spent hours learning how to use a little camcorder. And I just started, it was a video camcorder, so it wasn't really great for photos, but it could record right. video for hours on end. Um, and I went around just recording everything. Um, you know, I thought I was a filmmaker back then. I just recorded everything. My actual deliverable was to record fishermen um, for conservation project and get their perspectives on the project. And you know, through a little bit of time when I was doing that is you know when I really learned, um, when I really got a different perspective on conservation from the other side of people, um, not the other yeah. side, but from a different um, category of people, and just hearing these fishermen talk about you know some of the issues they face. Um, at this point, I wasn't you know I was still very green in this field. You know, I wasn't mm -hmm. sure about all these issues here and there. Yeah. But I knew there was a problem. The, the plan of Conk, I know BNT was trying to solve it. I had a role to play in you know capturing these um, interviews. Um, so, you know, I learned a lot from that. I was able to really um, get knowledgeable about conch um, and the decline of it. I was able to give presentations on it, um, on conservation and the plight of conch at okay. different conferences and stuff. But anyway, that same camcorder I used, um, you know, I used to take that in the bush and record birds at the retreat. Um, I spent, you know, that was a point of that internship um, where I just used to sit in the bush for hours um, at Green Hell, which is a feature in the retreat. Yeah. Man made water feature. And mosquitoes used to be biting me, but I just used to sit there for hours recording um, winter migrants, which are like wobblers and other migratory birds. Mm -hmm. And I just sat there for hours and hours just recording those birds. And that's when I really realized, like, you know, from the outside looking in, the, the retreat is just like a bunch of bush, it's a bunch of palm trees, it's green. You definitely see the pigeons. You recognize the pigeons, you recognize the American casuals. Um, and you recognize some of the other easy to recognize birds. Yeah. But only when I sat in those different spots at the retreat for hours on end, I'm very still until the point where the birds got either used to me or couldn't see me. Um, I realized how much colors were in was in the bush, colors as in the colors of the birds, how much different species. Yeah. And that really piqued my interest with birds. Um, at this point, uh, um, sadly enough, I was that's when like, Harky and Dorian had a hit. Not Dorian, Matthew. Uh, Matthew, yeah. Matthew, yeah. yeah. When so Parker Matthew had hit, and you know, of course, that did a lot of damage on New Providence. So the government took most of the people in that program. I skipped, so I skipped something completely. <laughs> so um, after my intern, after my little summer program, I volunteered to be in for a few months. I would just come back to work um, and do things here and there. That's when right. I started really volunteering with the parks department 
and the education department. Um, and then the government started a program in 2016 called the Youth Environmental Core Program. Mm -hmm. And the original purpose of this program is to um, hire a lot of young Bahamians to work in the environmental and the environmental sector, which also included like, you know, sound and, like cleaning sides of the roads and stuff like that. Right. There was also a lot of people that went to the BNT. Um, so I was brought into that program because um, I had a good relationship with the Minister of Environment at the time, Honorable Henry Dawson. Um, so I was brought into that program. He was a fan of me because of, um, I went to Anatol Rogers, that school was in his constituency. Um, and I was doing choral stuff back then. So it was like the most amazing thing ever. I mean, when I shared my photos for the first time of like me diving with sharks in 2015, yeah, everybody thought I was like Mr. Nature at that point. Um, <laughs> I know he really, you know, he was really, you know, he saw my passion and he really invested a lot into me and he, you know, make sure I was into this program, even That's though I was too young to be into the program. I was only 17 at that point. Um, but I went into the program and as soon as the program was about to start is when Matthew hit. So instead of going to the BNT and, you know, working on the stuff that I was hoping I was going to work on, um, I was sent to Botanical Gardens with most people to assist with hurricane cleanup, uh, which yeah. was so great. You know, I did landscaping for like two years at that point. I was, you know, all okay. for the hard bush, the, you know, the hard work in the bush. Um, so we went to Botanical Gardens and we did a lot of hurricane cleanup. And I was proud of that because Food Fest would have not happened that year without that cohort of people working um, at Botanical Gardens. Um, but anyway, eventually the hurricane passed and you know everything came back to normal. And then I was sent back to the BNT when I then went into the education department, nice. um, which was a lot of, you know, working with school kids, you know, doing camps, um, doing workshops, you know, learning different skills, um, doing presentations, park interpretation. And also there was a national program the BNT um, had initiated where there was a six month training program to train people to become Bahamian naturalists. So it taught you about um, geology and botany and ornithology and different um, sectors of science and you know, people in that field. And right. that's when the interest in birds really, really hiked up. Um, Scott Johnson was our bird teacher, and of course it's Scott. So, you know, Scott Jackson. Yeah. <laughs> um, and, you know, I was at a competitive spirit. I still have a competitive spirit. I was going to say, you still have this huge competitive spirit, big confidence. Um, I'll stay from the E word. Yeah, we, we get to that. The E word? Is that what it was? Oh, yeah. No. Okay, we get to that afterwards. Anyway. Yeah. So, you know, birds at that point was, you know, something for me. It's, it, it was an aspect of competition to it, you know. Mm -hmm. I wanted to learn all the birds. I wanted to know their names. So Scientific I spent, names, yeah. Yeah, definitely the binomial names as well. You know, so a lot of the time when, you know, we were given tasks as the naturalist group, you know, go do a presentation or to help the education department do something, I didn't care. I you know, went off into the bush to go record birds. Um, and nobody knew where I was, but I was just there. I found my old camcorder again, and I would just sit in the bush, just recording birds, recording birds. I do retreat, um, mm -hmm. filming them, taking photos of them. And I remember like we had this quiz, we had quizzes to pass each aspect of the course, you know, and I, I made a bet, Scott Johnson, that I would list all of my birds in scientific names. Um, this was 30 birds I think he tested us with. So we're just putting the bird on the screen and then um, getting us to write them down. So it was bird identification. And I was like, I'm gonna name all my birds in the scientific names to show you how good I know birds. Um, I couldn't do it, right? Cause I realized like <laughs> halfway through the test, I was like, okay. Um, I only know like 22 of these names, but then I was smart. So I was like, you know what? I can't go down. I had too much ego. Um, so I was like, I couldn't go down like this. So I was like, you know what? I'm going to just challenge him that I could do half in scientific and half in the common names. And of course I could have done that because I knew enough. Um, I spelled a good chunk of the scientific names wrong. Yeah. And your early there. lesson in managing yeah. your expectations. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, but I still did it. So I still, the names were correct. It's just I had the E in the wrong place or the I in the wrong place. It happens. But, you know, that passion for birds grew um, right then and there. And being at the retreat was the perfect place to learn about birds. So I spent a lot of time just birding and bird watching and recording birds and taking photos of them and, you know, um, observing species and putting them on eBird, which yeah. is a form of citizen science. Um, and I was able to like, you know, record the most species seen at the retreat on eBird. You know, Scott still insists he has more than me. I don't believe him, but he insists he's seen more birds at the retreat than me. But competition never ends. <laughs> never ends. Um, but anyway, you know, that was my early days. That's when I really, really got involved in um, capturing nature or, you know, documenting nature in the form of birds. So, you know, it was pretty exciting. 
back then I stayed in that Natchez program for a long time. Um, and then eventually, through all my work, this camp got started to teach myself more things. I got, you know, better hold of better cameras, you know, personally or professionally. And more exciting things started to happen at the BNT. Well, not started to happen, but I got involved with them and had the yeah. chance to document them. Like mm -hmm. eco camp and um, summer camps and Discovery Club and all these different things. So eventually, you know, I don't know exactly who it was. I'm sure it was Eric Carey, but, you know, <laughs> was, there was great potential in me to do media stuff for the BNT. Um, and so I started to get pushed more in that direction, um, you know, getting more professionally trained in media, well, self-trained, still like, you know, encouraged to do it. Yeah, I can university, you too. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. <laughs> and eventually, you know, I was, they, BNT started formally a communications department and I was the first person in that department. So the department started with me and I got a manager at that time who was a you know, great person, Heather Carey. And, you know, she really made sure that you know, this is something I stuck with. You know, everybody always say I had a lot of talent in it. And I was just like, you know, I'm just really, you know, doing what I learned on YouTube. But, you know, that was the official start of the communications department at the BNT um, mm -hmm. in 2017, I think. Um, yeah, because I had joined in around late 2016. I remember when you got moved into the communications right. department. Yeah, yeah. yeah yes, you're right. So um, definitely was around that time. And you know, that's when I started taking it serious. I'm learning a lot. I started doing social media. Started to learn photography, um, you know, more. I got a hold of a professional camera personally. And the BNT also invested in like some high quality um, professional video equipment. And, you know, long story short, because I've been talking for a while, like I just <laughs> had the opportunity to capture national parks and travel around the Bahamas and just document so many cool things that would later, you know, fuel my passion and fuel my career right now. Okay. So right now, fast forward, skip a few years, I am the senior communications officer. And my responsibility is again to just oversee external communications and you know make sure I'm communicating conservation, national parks, and BNT programs and projects, um, not just locally but like nationally. Um, right. And I've seen a lot of success in this field, and you know I am very grateful. And, you know, and one of the things, um, well, it's two things you said that I really want to actually pause and expand on a bit more is the fact that you um, one yourself taught, right? Like you decided that you wanted to do something, you found what resources were available, which would be University of YouTube, but I'm sure you got your hand on other books and resources that you can see, like I'm sure looking at maybe what other conservation communicators were doing, and you really took that and you crafted yourself and you, you became exactly what you wanted to be, right? This amazing communicator in conservation. And the other thing that you mentioned briefly, which I think you really should spend a bit more time on is from my perspective, and I'm sure many others agree with me, and you could even agree or not, when you got your hand on the social media for the Bahamas National Trust, you really took this old organization and you brought it into the new age. And I think I remember seeing, like, after you had started putting, you know, videos for certain days and taking certain pictures and posting it, you even followed the the baby chicks, uh, what was it, the Antillia Nighthawk, like just little things that you were like, this would be great to put on social media. And you you made yourself aware of well, what works on social media and you tested things out and you tried things out and you really can see that people were starting to share more things with the Bahama, Bahamas National Trust. People were following the Bahamas National Trust on social media more. And I remember a lot of people who would know that I worked there was like, yeah, you guys are really like, more visible on social media. So I think you should stop and actually give yourself some credit for that because I don't think that it would have gotten as quickly as it did without you. Do you agree with <laughs> You're smiling. Um, I don't know, you give credit to others if where credit is due, but just like I'm saying, from my perspective, I remember when you started, you know, really pushing to put things on the social media, mm -hmm. on the Facebook, the proper Instagram, like it was, it really made an impact for the Bahamas National Trust. Yeah, thank you, first of all. Um, and yes, I, I totally agree. Um, you know, it's like you said, you know, it took me a while to get, um, you know, like I could always remember, like I had this very specific goal back then. Because um, again, I was like the youngest person in the organization. I was basically- Still are. I'm still am, yes. Um, <laughs> but anyway, back then it was much different, right? So I was like 17, you know, sweet young kid walking around. Um, you know, the BNT is a national organization, very credible. You know, a lot of people look up to the BNT. Um, so, you know, I had to gain that trust. You know, so I had this really specific goal of being able to manage the Facebook page. Um, yeah. You know, and I had to prove that I was worthy of it. You know, I had no professional background. I mean, this kid just came out of high school. Like, what does he know about <laughs> social media? Um, 
But I had to, you know, I had to gain that trust. And I ended up managing like micro pages. I was remember I managed like a Discovery Club page and the Eco okay. page for education. Um, but as you and you remember this too, like I always had the goal. Like I wasn't posting for those programs. Like I was posting just to show that I could create content for the main yep. page. And as you said, like making videos for certain days. Like I know you remember, like I think it was either your first week, it was maybe like your first couple of Yeah, days. I was I narrated something. Yes, like, you narrated a documentary I did on the Bahama Woodstock. Yeah. Um, which was it's one it was one of the Bahamian endemic birds, a little hummingbird. And spending mm -hmm. so much time at the retreat, I had a lot of access footage of this little bird. Um, yeah. you know, and I, I thought your voice was very attractive back then. So I was like, hey, it still maybe, is. Yeah. I was like, hey, maybe this, you know, um she still, could, you have to say it still is. It still is, yes, it still is. <laughs> Um, but I was like, maybe she can narrate this video for me. So, you know, I wrote a script. I remember that day writing that script. And mm -hmm. I think we did one side of the retreat. And then you eventually went home and did the, like, script in your closet or something. And I put <laughs> the video together. And, you know, that was my first, probably one of my first, it was, it was proper back then, but my first long-form piece of content on Bahamian ecology. At this point, it was a bird. Um, and, you know, I showed that to everybody. I was the proudest person ever. Um, I was like, hey, look what I did on the Bahama Woodstock. And people were impressed, of course. And I was like, hey, look what I did, look what I did. And everybody, you know, people liked it. Um, that didn't go live on social media, but then we did another video. It was World Wetlands World Day. World Wetlands Day, right. yeah, I remember. And that, I, I mean, am so with plastic, plastic as well. Plastic yes. yeah. So we did a video. Um, I did that video to win a GoPro from Brief. And um, you won. I felt bad, though, because, you know, when they did the ceremony, um, it was at a school. And so, like, third place and second place with these grade six kids, and then, like, first place with this 17 you know, year old. I'm like, goodness, what did I do? Like, <laughs> well, if you feel that bad, I could have the GoPro. I mean, my voice was in it. So, so that GoPro, as a point, is at the bottom of like a blue hole at this point, I think. And I'm just, um, but you know, anyway. I'm not gonna say I'm surprised. I'll just leave that there. <laughs> yeah, I'll leave that. So, we, we, I mean, you know, we did a lot of videos and I posted them on Discovery Club, and you no, know, people liked them. You know, that was good, especially when they learned that I did them. Um, my first real public recognition for a video was when I did, you also remember this, we did something for Bird Guides. BNT did a program. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. BNT did a program to train bird guides in Anderson and Agua. Mm -hmm. And I tasked myself, along with you and Scott Johnson, to do this video just recognizing the program and recognizing the guides. Um, and I still look at this video to this day, and I just, like always smile so much and I look at it. And you know, at the, I think they had a ceremony at the Hilton or something. Mm -hmm. um, we played the video, Mark Donalds introduced the video and played it. And then at the end, he brought me up on stage and he was like, you know, this is the kid who did this, incredible. People clapped or whatever. And, you know, that's when I think the majority of the organization, um, how, how do I want to word this, recognized it. I definitely know Eric Carey recognized it because every time he would introduce me to somebody, he would always say that's when he remembered mm -hmm. me or, you know, take notice of what I was doing because he, nobody knew I was doing this video except you and Scott. And yeah. then Mark, you know, just introduced me afterwards. And that was the first public video I did. And, you know, after all that content stuff and all these things, um, I eventually had the carry was like, you know what? You guys got this incredible young man right here, you know, managing these Facebook pages, doing this great thing. He should be managing the main page. Because at that point, it was just, it wasn't nobody's responsibility to manage the page. Yeah. It was like a second responsibility, someone just doing it. But I was like, you know, he's young, he's more in tune with social media, you know, he should be doing it. And I, I got it and I was the proudest person ever um, to manage that Facebook page. And I just went crazy with the content. Um, and like you said, it was, I took it from, you know, one level to the next, you know, just about following. Because the had a sensible following back then, it was like 18,000 yeah. people, but it was just content and quality of content. And like super fast forward later, it's like the things, the reviews I get back on us, just like, one aspect, which is our social media, are incredible. Yeah. I mean, like I've had multiple staff members come to me and say, you know, I applied to work at this organization because of the things I saw on social media. Exactly. Other things we started doing on Instagram, you know, people started to mimic us. You know, one thing I did was like take our ambassadors to Andrews, Andrew Musgrove and Sasha Callis. And so much people started coming to Andrews after that and doing the exact same things we did. Yeah. And so many people decided to recognize what he's doing on social media. And I saw our reach go from a few thousands to I mean, a few hundred thousand to like a few million. Um, and you know, that's just social media now. It's so much more, there's website, there's email, there's so much yeah. different things. So um, it's, yeah, like you said, it was just taking what you have, whatever available resources was there and, you know, doing the most with it. Um, you know, that's what that camcorder was for me. Just that's what was done. And I used that until I could get better. And 
you know, when I had, you know, the right support, and my manager in place, Heather Carey, was able to advocate for professional video equipment, which is 4K at the time. Um, so that 4, 4K was like a new thing back then. And So what and, is it and, now? Is it not still 4K? Um, no, the, the stuff we do is still in 4K quality. But I mean, like right now you have 8, 16, 24K, you have these high-tech cameras. Okay. Um, and <laughs> 4K is still so respected because yeah. most screens, computer screens and phone screens don't render stuff in 4K still. So it's still, you know, good. You know, it's great quality still. Mm -hmm. But anyway, we was able to get our hands on those and drones and stabilizers and underwater stuff. And just, you know, I went the long road and teach myself how to use these things and just kept doing what I was doing. You know, I don't make videos as much right now as I used to because I have so much other responsibilities, but it's still something I do a lot. And it's, it's, it's great. The impact you can have on people and the stuff you can do from just creating a simple video, a simple photo is yeah. tremendous. You know, and that happens a lot, right? Like you start off working in any field and you're so passionate and you get to do your one little thing and you get to do it well and everyone's impressed by it and then they make you start doing other things and then the thing that you love doing just gets that much further away, but but you're still able to get into the field. I know you just traveled, what was that, seven islands in four days or? Yeah. Right, like, and most Bahamians don't get to even make it, like you originally said, like I, you've never been off of Nassau and I think it's so amazing that you've been able to travel across the country and capture these images but what is it that that inspires you? Like when you're taking a photo, well, you say you don't do videos as much now. So when you're taking that photo, how do you, like, what is that moment when you realize, aha, this is the shot? Like, what, how do you know? Mm, that's a good question. Um, let me just address the earlier part of what you said. So when I said I didn't do video as much, I don't mean I don't still capture video as much. Yeah. I, don't, I capture video more, I just don't have the time to actually sit down and uh, produce things, yeah, you know? Yeah. Um, but, <laughs> So in terms of when do I know something is right, um, before I go out in the field, um, I mean, just naturally, I, I already know what I want to capture, right? Like, you know, I, I don't sit down and be like, I want to capture this and that. Only when I'm going somewhere specific then I know what I want to capture. But in terms of when I'm actually behind the camera and I see someone is like, hey, that's what I want. You know, I have something called, I have something called, there's thing called hero shots. Um, a hero shot is something you definitely want to capture is the most impactful image you want to capture. Um, so when I'm in the field, there are certain things I'm looking for. There are certain things where I would consider a hero shot. Like if I capture this thing, like I could go and have a bear after this. Like I could sit down and, <laughs> and you can food. rest. Yeah. Um, so for example, one specific example, like, um, I went to Abaco after Dorian. Yeah. So after Dorian, you know, we were there and, you know, I always had this specific feeling. I wanted to capture, um, Bahama pirates and the pine forest. Um, there was so much pictures and videos of these birds. Like, and kamalami trees and fruit trees eating fruit because they're easy to see like that because that's what they come yeah. to eat. So everybody had that. But you know, I, you know, um, you can't, well, if you can't tell or if you could tell, like I am a huge fan, follower, believer of national parks, right? I, it's close to my heart. It's like, it's a thing I believe in. It's something I will forever personally work um, towards advancing. So anyway, I wanted to capture the story of the Abaco National Park or the Bahama Park is a bit better than what you would normally see, which is basically so the story of the Abaco National Park was that um, it was created to protect the northern breeding ground of the Bahama Park, which is yeah. pine habitat, southern Abaco. Um, you know, and so I wanted to really show Bahama pirates in pine trees. Um, but it was way more difficult to capture because, as you know, pine trees can grow up so high, and all of the branches are high, so you're not. You Don't know, tell me you climbed a tree. No, I definitely didn't climb it. <laughs> <laughs> but there would be at a truck, and I still was behind the truck with the camera. I mean, you have zoom lenses, I can point it up and go. Mm -hmm. But anyway, so that was always something that I wanted to um, capture. So my whole time in Abaco, that was on my mind. And as the cursor at that point, I was just like, I need, we need to capture pirates and pine trees at a sunset because sunsets and sunrises produce the most beautiful images in terms of lighting. And like you get an emotional connection from just seeing a sunset in a photo. Yeah. Anyway, we were in Abaco and was, my mind was on that the entire time. I'm like, you know, we just one day we were coming from doing field surveys in Abaco National Park. And on our way home, it was the sunset because it was late. And like the like, three little pirates like shoot across the road. He was in the pine forest. And I was like, wait, we got to stop. Like, this is what we need. They landed right there. Let's go get these shots. And then we just heard something like in the distance. And, you know, as it's got to at that point, and we just like, hey, stop. That sounds like a lot of birds. And like a minute, like we stand still for a minute and then we like continue slowly driving, like 200 pirates flew over us. 
and just like landing all up in the pine trees and wow. like that was that's still like one of my favorite experiences in nature right so i was able to capture those images and like those images went a long way into communicating like the Apple national park you know this is a pine forest habitat um so anyway i started to ramble but anyway like when I'm in the field, I'm always looking to capture a perspective that people like don't normally have, right? Because um, a lot of things you can easily miss in nature, right? Um, birds, animals, no, sorry, like birds, underwater animals, <laughs> animals. Like most people will never get the perspective that people like us in the field would have. Yeah. Um, so I was trying to capture a perspective that is, is different, that you won't see. One thing I always think about is like eye level, you know, most people go certain height, so they see things from a certain height. You know, so when I'm capturing birds, I try to get at the eye level with the bird. Um, so either I'm on the floor or I'm like higher up in the tree. It's easier to be on the floor than in a tree. So I'm normally lower on the floor. And you realize is that when you capture yeah. these different perspectives, people respond to them differently. And they're much more impactful okay. than people giving someone a perspective that they always had. And that's why um, underwater images are so popular because most people would never be underwater to a point to see things how most photographers capture, capture them. So it's like looking for a perspective that people don't almost don't normally have. But another thing is like looking for like you know photography. You know, just a photo is a photo, right? But yeah. I don't just like capture simple photos anymore when I'm talking about conservation. It's always looking for something that has a story. You have to like weave storytelling into this media stuff, right? So I'm always right. looking to capture a photo that tells a story. Um, and that's so many different things, you know, like mangroves are so popular, right? And everybody loves mangroves, everybody wants to say mangroves. So I give them the mangrove ecosystem, I want to capture an image that shows, you know, everyone knows mangroves are nurseries, so that's something people are always showing. You see the, the right. popular mangrove image of the sharks and the fish underneath. Um, what I'm trying to capture is like, you know, showing the roots of a red mangrove, like how they actually built the land, you know, how they actually stabilize the coast or hold the land in place. Right. Just the things like that, like what has the story, what has a story to tell, what hasn't been told yet, what can drive conservation action, can inspire conservation action by everyday citizens. That's what you know drives my storytelling or my photography and cinematography. Mm -hmm. Right, because I know, um, I, and I had mentioned this to you when I originally had asked you to come on the show, it was this quote that you had on one of your posts, and I think it just summed it up so beautifully, and I have it, and it's, um, I had to literally just go and grab it. To connect people to wildlife and nature, we have to give them a perspective they don't normally have. And just like you said, especially in the Bahamas, not a lot of people are getting into the water. Nope. First of all, because most of us can't swim, but mm -hmm. in actually none of them are getting into the water and actually seeing, you know, what is it that makes the Bahamas the Bahamas? Not a lot of people are getting into the forest because they're scared of the bush, bush crack, mm -hmm. man, gone. Like nobody's seeing these things. So it's so nice that you can bring bring these images and bring this video to the public so they can now experience some of the things that we as conservationists see every single day. And one of the last things I do want to talk about, because I don't want to take up your whole Sunday afternoon, um, one of the things that you've been recently working on is capturing, you know, these old Bahamian stories. And I know a lot of Bahamians talk about, you know, you got to make sure to talk to your older generations because there's mm -hmm. history that we don't know. And I think people don't realize that there's also conservation and environmental history that, that these older generations have. And so can you tell us a little bit even about your recent experience with the beloved Mr. Basil Minns in Exuma and just how, how that's even maybe given you a new perspective or can possibly give others a new perspective? Right. Um... So yeah, I can definitely talk about my experience with Basel Mints. Um, you know, one thing I, I think um, we miss a lot in conservation is, you know, we all like to tell the stories of species and spaces, but I think we'll be doing a disservice to conservation and also telling the stories of people, you know, involved with, you know, protecting these species and spaces, right? Yeah. Um, I mean, conservation is as old as, you know, whatever, like it's, it's not something new. It may be super popular now um, because more people are getting involved and, you know, <laughs> The green thing to do, the problem mm -hmm. is part of the environment, right? But the you know, conservation goes way back. You know, there are so many people involved with conservation from the early ages. Um, you know, BNT itself has a 60 plus, um, 60 year plus history. Yeah. So, you know, like there's a lot of stories, a lot of people stories to tell about conservation. Um, and conservation goes beyond and just like, you know, saving this bird or, you know, protecting this patch of sound, this patch of reef. You know, it's like, it's so connected to everything that we do. Um, and, you know, like it ramble about, like ramble about that forever. But anyway, so, you know, I take it, 
I think another important thing to do for everybody in this field is to tell the stories of the people involved in conservation. Um, and, you know, an organization like the BNT has a lot of rich history, a lot of people involved with, you know, driving certain things in the past. Uh -huh. So, you know, when I had the opportunity to, I, I always knew about Basil Mims from reading him. I do a lot of reading, right? Um, I spend a lot of time reading things, especially about subjects I want to capture, stories I want to tell. I spend a lot of time reading about it. And, you know, um, I went to Mariah Harbor once. I can't remember when that was, but I went there once. Our park, yeah, it's a beautiful natural area, you know. And I was say like, one day I'm gonna tell a story, and I, you know, it has an interesting story because there was this, you know, this man, this legend, you know, Basil Mins and his wife Jane, who really fought to get this park protected. Yes, um, the legends. You know, so on my, I had three trips after that. So my one of my trips to Exuma recently, I had the chance to sit down with him and just capture his, you know, story on camera. Um, I've not. Again, edited that video yet because of time. <laughs> I did write a story. Um, and it was just incredible, man. I mean, he, he also is a photographer. He's one of, like one of the first people involved in like promoting tourism and stuff like that, ecotourism. Yeah. And he's also a naturalist. And so just listening to him and like hear him talk about stuff like you know, watching, you know, like you watched a lot of people watch like BBC Earth and stuff like that. So you might have seen like I think it's called One Planet that like Dan yeah. and borrow. I know this film is super powerful because eventually it goes into like what will happen in Earth in 20, 50, 100 years. But at the beginning, he talked about like witnessing, you know, certain things with his own eyes. And, you know, like sitting down with Basil Mins, like I also, you know, heard and seen the same thing. Like he talked yeah. about like witnessing a decline of biodiversity with his own eyes. Um, yeah. I think Basil is 94 now. I think he just celebrated a birthday. And it was like, this is crazy. Like, you know, this is you know, the difference between then and now is, is astonishing. So it was such a great experience. I mean, still, it's like, that's my favorite interview I ever did. I mean, it was so great to sit there and also capture a story that'll go a long yeah. way into advancing conservation today. Yeah, I, because as I've said, I mean, I'll, I'll say our part, but Mariah Harbor Key National Park, to my knowledge and in my time, has like a really rich history for conservation. And Mr. Minns and his wife, Jane, um, they did so much work. And I think, a lot of times when people, again, when people talk about Bahamian history, so much of that is wrapped around even just the conservation environment because our country is just so tied to our natural resources that you just, we can't keep leaving that part out. So I'm so happy that you got to do that. And I'm excited to hopefully see that video come out and many other videos of you, you know, capturing these stories of Bahamians who have been in this sector far longer than we've even been on this island. Um, but before we start wrapping up, where can people see some of these images and how can people get involved to maybe either one day be like you or close to you <laughs> and get involved with the Bahamas National Trust and just being in this, you know, communications conservation environment? Um, so two things. Uh, well, to get involved with the BNT or to see like some of my work, you can definitely follow um, the Bahamas National Trust on social media, Facebook, okay. Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I mean, most of the things you'd see there would be my work. Uh, well, it's just following me on Instagram. I think you'll go on Instagram somewhere up there. Um, somewhere, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> and that's where you can see most of my work, um, my writing, videos, photos, a lot of things I do. Yeah. Um, in terms of getting involved in this field, I do want to say, I think right now the Bahamas is kind of catching that fire where, you know, the environmental movement is growing rapidly. Yes. Um, and there's going to be a lot a lot of opportunity in this field pretty soon, I feel like, um, career opportunities for young people. And, you know, I think there's going to be a lot of, also a lot of funding available for positions um, mm -hmm. in, this, in this field. So I think, you know, it's just, if there's something you're interested in, just me personally, and like what I do for the National Trust, like I like to look at international organizations. I like to set the bar really high. And I try to keep anything we do at an international standards. So I always try to learn from people doing it the best. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, just again, this is the age of information. Everything is on Google nowadays. Like anything you yeah. can learn in a school or an educational institution, you can learn with two Google searches. So it's like, and that's how I taught myself. I, I Googled everything. I read awfully long scientific, you know, papers and journals. And that's what I used to fuel my work and to teach myself. Um, because you want to be knowledgeable about what you do um and you know you also want to be you know confident about what you do i want to be, to be confident if you're sure that you have the information you got the knowledge um, yes you do not lack confidence right you know and you know that's that's something you know that's definitely something i think more 
young people have to get in the habit of, you know, teaching themselves is, you know, don't, people always say, like, you know, be humble, have humility, like, do not confuse being humble to having a lack of confidence, you know. People say, oh, he's arrogant, you know, walking a fine line, but it's like the same fine line you walk between being confident and being arrogant is the same fine line you walk between being humble and having a lack of confidence. You do not want to have a lack of confidence in this field, right? You don't have the lack of confidence in anything that you do. Um, I, like you said, have no lack of confidence, you know, um, I definitely was, I would say back then a bit arrogant, but you know, it's learning, you learn things as you go, you tune yourself down, nobody comes into this world perfect, but <laughs> like, you got to have the confidence to be, you know, to, and just try to be the best of what you do, you know, just, keep yeah. up and, you know, I would never say that I wasn't arrogant, but I would definitely say that I had to learn to have confidence. <laughs> And like that's what gets you recognized. Like I was confident enough to believe that those little, you know, if you look at those videos, that are kind of scary. But like I was confident enough to believe that those videos were the best thing on the planet, and everybody should see them, and the world should see them. And that's like the one of the sole reasons why I'm in the position I am today is because I had that confidence. You know, yeah. if I created those videos and I was like, oh, this is terrible, I can't show anybody this. I would, I God knows what I'd be doing right now. So yeah. just having the confidence to do what you do, and you know, right now I'm seeing that. You know that excess confidence I had, you know, paid off. It, it definitely paid off, and you yeah. know, so it just little slap advice in there is like, you know, have confidence for sure. Do not have a lack of confidence in anything that you do. Yes, you can be humble with it. You know, use your, you know, be smart with it. You know, figure out you need to be humble. Right? <laughs> you need to be confident, but don't just go out to the world just being too humble for yourself because you can do the yeah. same damage you do if you're too arrogant. So, yeah. Just, walk with confidence and ask with confidence. Yeah. yeah, and I think the overarching themes of what you're saying is, one, be sure in yourself. And the only way you can be sure in yourself is if you equip yourself with that knowledge, be exactly. confident and be your best self, right? Like, yes, mm -hmm. try to be the best, but make sure that the best is you being your best. Because there are some people that are naturally good at things and they don't put much effort and thought into their mm -hmm. work. So be your best self and your best work will hopefully become the best work in the world. Um, but before we close and say thank you to all our viewers, last question, fun question. What is your favorite sea creature and why? Ooh. Now you had time to think, so. <laughs> I don't know. I mean, um, I love, okay, this is a group of creatures, so don't, you know, give me some a break. I mean, I love sharks. Sharks are definitely one of my okay. favorite groups of creatures. And I would narrow that down to a specific shark. I'd probably say a tiger shark. I just love tiger sharks. Um, okay. I just love how they look. Um, you know, I just love everything about them. Um, they're very confident creatures, and that's why I love them. So, love tiger sharks. Yeah. Interesting. Maybe you would have been a, a tiger shark if you had been born into the shark realm. Yeah, you right? ever like you ever seen a young tiger shark? Like they bite everything, and they will like they will chase everything. That's very confident. You know? I've never seen that. that arrogant in the um, shark world. Animals, yeah. But not a like super young one because you don't see people haven't really seen super young tiger sharks. But a uh, young -huh. tiger shark is a pretty curious, confident creature. Just tagging that in there for your viewers. That's probably why you like them. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely, you know, just go and bite and chomp at everything. Why not? Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Elijah, for taking the time out on your Sunday afternoon and chopping up with me on Siren Sundays. Thank you so much to our proud sponsor, Science and Perspective, because we all need a little bit more science and a lot more perspective. And thank you all for watching and riding this wave with us. I hope to catch you next time on Siren Sundays. Always yours, Lashanti the Siren. Thanks, everyone. <laughs>